Hey, it's David Andrew Weeb in the lab, and it's great to be back with another podcast episode. I just wanted to let you know that in this interview, some of the audio cuts out a bit. It might be a little hard to listen to at times, but the meaning still comes across. So user beware, just adjust your volume or do whatever it is you got to do. But I think for the most part, it's quite coherent. So enjoy. <laughs> Today, I am passing the mic with creator of the Fans Media and Industry Attraction Method, arts and entertainment publicist, panelist and mentor at multiple conferences like Canadian Music Week and Indie Week, and multi-passionate artist coach and podcaster, Diane Foy. How are you today, Diane? I'm good. I have a lot of titles. (laughs) You sure do. I hope that uh, pretty much covers off what we need to get into there. Yeah. The first piece of the fans media and industry attraction method, and I love that term method here, is doing the deep work required to determine your authentic personal brand. Why is this so important? Because most artists skip it. And like I was a publicist for 18 years. And in the early days, it was kind of you know easy to get press for up and coming bands as well as the big celebrities, but it got harder and harder for the up and comers. And you could no longer just, I have a new album out or I have a new music out. That's not enough to get press. And more and more, it got harder and harder to get press for the up and comers that I loved working with. And I would say, like, you know, um, you need a more, you need to have more interesting stories. You need to have a professional photo shoot. You need social media activity. And, and then I realized that they don't really know how to do all that. So that's what (laughs) brought me to coaching and the personal branding stuff. Like everyone knows that, oh, I need to be more consistent on social media, or they think, oh, I'll hire a publicist and, and they'll get me press and that. But unless you know who you are and what you represent and what, you know, is unique about you, you can hire a publicist, you can hire a social media marketing agency, a radio promoter, but you're not going to be happy with the results, most likely, just because you're not giving these people enough to work with. And it's all about connection. So if you think about your favorite artists, you probably love them for more than just their music. You love the way they dress. They, you love their attitude, their personality, their story. Maybe there's something in their story that you connect to. And there's this whole package. And so going back to that indie artist that says, hey, I have a new single to promote. So does everybody. So what is it about you that you can connect with people? And I'm all about being authentic. Like, And I know it takes some time to kind of get comfortable kind of putting yourself out there. But the more you do it, the more comfortable you are. And then when you get to social media and you get to publicity, you have a lot more confidence and you know what to share because, you know, even when I first started coaching, people would be like, okay, when are you going to get to the teaching me social media and publicity? I'm like, but you don't know what you're promoting yet. And, (laughs) and I can give you all the social media strategies in the world, but you're still going to be at a loss of what to post. What the heck to post? (laughs) because <laughs> you have to post so often to get any attention there. So whereas if you take the time to let's explore your future vision, what do you really want and why do you want it? What are your core values? What are your core beliefs? Are there limiting beliefs holding you back from really putting yourself out there? We all have those. And what parts of your story makes you unique? What experiences have you had that people can relate to? What vulnerability can you share? What parts of your personality do people enjoy about you? And then it's also your fashion sense, your style, you know, put some effort into it. (laughs) You know, tell a story through what you wear too, and your image. And all of that tells a story that Mm -hmm. 
hopefully connects the right people to you. And it's also figuring out who are your ideal super fans. Who's going to be the most, there's going to be, um, you know, lots of people that love your music to get those super fans that are going to support everything you do, buy every concert ticket, buy all your merch and support you. It takes that special extra connection. So who are those people that are most likely to appreciate all that you have to offer? Yeah, you explained it very well. And PR, I know it used to be like, let's choose which distribution service to use. And that was about the only thing you even had to think about. And that quickly mm-hmm. changed as journalists and media people didn't enjoy receiving spam in their inbox anymore and had to start putting some criteria into place for outreach. So yeah. I, I know that was a, such a dramatic change uh, with online PR, especially in the last 15, 20 years. Yeah, for sure. And then I think I have branding or personal branding or let's say artist branding as as a foundational piece mm-hmm. to the whole marketing equation as well. Everything that you said, mm-hmm. really, uh, I would have to echo you. If you don't know who you are, what your purpose is, the difference you want to make in the world, the impact you want to have, then it's really hard to know how to market you effectively. Music for music's sake has been done and most people don't care. There's just too much music for people to care. Yeah. And also without your knowing your purpose and your why, it's too easy to quit. Yes. It's hard. (laughs) It's hard to make a living. It's in the arts. It's hard to get noticed and stand out. And if you're not really clear about what you want and why you want it, it's too easy to quit because it's so hard, you know, but if you have very clear on what you want to achieve, And why? What is the why behind it? And we all want to make an impact. Like, think about other people, not just you. Like, what's in it for you? Yes, you love, enjoy, you enjoy creating and you love getting recognized for that. But you probably also want to make an impact with your music. And it's like you all have those artists or those songs that just really changed your life or changed your mood that day and means so much to you, you probably want your music to do that to people too. So think about what is that impact you want to make on the world, on those ideal super fans. And then the more clear you are, like I'm a perfect example because I'm an introvert and there's a reason why all my careers have been behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But now everyone has to put themselves out there. Everyone has to be yeah. visual and put themselves on video. And I avoided that for a long time. <laughs> and uh, and also even to share about myself and my purpose. But the more you do it, the more comfortable you get and the more clear you are on that purpose. Then when you talk, it's like the passion you have for what you do is contagious. And that's what you want to get to. Absolutely. I've been working from home for six years and nomadically for three years. If I didn't have enough, a big enough why I wanted to do things that way and to move my life in that direction, forget it. It just would not happen. And even having come to this point, we always think the grass is greener, but guess what? It hasn't been a bed of roses either. <laughs> so yeah. things happen anyway. We all have all those, all us creatives probably have those moments of like, oh, I got to go get a real job. <laughs> I yeah. need that steady paycheck <laughs> and, and benefits. And that sounds really good. But if you're not the type of person who's not going to be happy, like, yeah, you can get that. But are you going to be happy doing that? Whereas might as well take risks and That's follow it. what you really want to do. And if you do the work, you'll get there. I like what you said about putting yourself out there as well. I think that's just never been more true. It's like drawing attention to yourself as all like you can't climb a rooftop and play a show anymore. It doesn't work that way. It works yeah. because it's you too. It works because it's the Beatles. It doesn't work anymore. You yeah. have to this invite people to be a part of what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. And you can't be as mysterious as, that's right. as Prince. Prince used to be. <laughs> totally. 
The second step is to find your social media super fans. This seems like a bit of a leap for me, given the fickleness of social media and how hard it can be to reach audiences organically. So I'd love for you to expand on why that's the next step in your method. I've recently changed the name of that Mm. (laughs) um, to purpose-driven content, because just even the word social media, and I'm in marketing, it's starting to stress me out. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. It's so again, returning to your purpose of why it's important, like in order to get where you want to go, you need the fans, media and industry and the easiest or quickest way to get that these days, it's online presence. It's your social media. And so you don't have to do it. But if you want to get where you want to go, like that's what I, that's a why again, knowing your purpose is like, I don't want to do all this social media either, but I really want what I want. And I know my purpose. So I'm going to keep going and push myself, push my comfort zones. And the phase two of purpose driven content, it's basically in the personal branding phase, you figured out who you are and what you want and why you want it and your core values and really explored your story. You know, the timeline of your life, the highlights, the lowlights, and you crafted a bio, but the purpose-driven content is just digging even deeper. All your stories. Sometimes we got to like have prompts to even remember our stories because we don't necessarily yeah. always look back, but you can get these books where you just flip it to a page and it asks you a question and it might spark a memory of something, you know, tell me about a time that you were on a boat. What? But that might spark a a memory of a story of when you were on a boat. And then you can take that story and how does that apply to what you do or what you offer or how does it apply to your audience? That's a story. So the overwhelming part of social media is that you have to post consistently and engage with the audience. It can quickly be a full-time job. Yes. And yes, that's why it's like, you got to create a balance. I'm starting to kind of not buy into that. We have to post 20 times a day, every day for the rest of our lives. Yeah. Not doing it anymore. So. Okay, so when I do post, like make it purposeful and take your stories, try and remember all the highlights of your life and then take pieces of it and tell a story behind it. Um, So with social media, like have like a hook, insight, call to action and have different categories of the things that you talk about. So it's not just listen to my new song, listen to my new song. It's If you think about the Instagram, when you first go to a profile, you kind of see the nine boxes. Does that nine boxes tell your brand story? Does that nine boxes give an overview of maybe one is about you, like something about your bio, some tell a story about an experience you had, then maybe another one is about, yeah, tell me about your new song, but tell me the story behind it. Tell me a story about when you were recording it something it's all about stories then the next one could be um about your why or encouragement so that it's not always about you encouragement now tell a story that will encourage and inspire others and so you have a variety of things that you talk about and part the first part of that mm-hmm. is collecting your stories so that when you are making a plan for social media you don't have to start from scratch You just go, what story do I want to tell today? What photo represents that story? Or do I want to go on video and tell the story on video? Or do I have any video footage from when I was recording the song that I could work into telling the story of the song? And all of that is so that you're constantly getting in front of the fans, media, and industry. Because that, if you just start thinking the social media is the tool it's the platform that's going to get you to make those connections. Then you think about it a little bit differently. 
instead yeah. of the, I know I have to post, but I don't know what to post and all the stress that comes with that purpose-driven content, create your stories, start documenting your life in a more purposeful way. You might not even know what you're going to do with this video clip, but later on down the line. And so like part of it is creating a story vault, creating a photo vault and video vault. And so that when you're ideal, you want to plan maybe a week ahead of social media. And so you're not, again, starting from scratch. You're like, okay, let's, what are the five topics I'm going to talk about this week? Okay, what stories do I have that showcase that? What photos pull from your vault and put them out? And then it's not enough to just post. You have to engage. And actually, if you have no time, if you only have a certain amount of time, I would definitely forget about posting. Go engage on other people's. And it's if you get clear about who it is that's most likely to appreciate what you have to offer, start go visiting them, go engage with their content. If you get if you start following um, people that you think would be your fan, like so say maybe you look up some artists that are similar genre, but are you want to kind of have a variety. So have some artists that are maybe where you want to be in five years. And then also have the super fan, the superstar people that you follow. But more important, look at who's commenting on their stuff. They might like you too. And so go see their page. And then you can start to have that. When I was saying like, know who's likely to appreciate it. It's like you start to get a picture of who your ideal super fan is. They might have a similar age group or that so that when you are posting content, you know who you're talking to, you know who you're wanting to attract. And then with engaging is like make a point of commenting on other people's posts. Um, a great tip is follow all your kind of potential super fans or ideal audience and watch their stories and react to their stories, like reply to their stories because that gets in their DMs. And that starts could start a conversation or it just tells the algorithm that you're friends and you want to see each other's uh, content more often. Mm. So that's a good one. It's like if something comes naturally, not a forced uh, reply, but if something comes naturally like that you want to reply to a story, the more you do that, the more your stuff will get shown to them. And same with industry. If there's certain industry that you need or want to get in front of make a make a list of your top 10 industry people that you want to be on their radar and just make a point of every week go visit their stuff go comment on their stuff engage with them where without any kind of expectation of anything in return you just want them to be aware of you and same with media when you get to media you know take some time to like I, I'll, for the artists that I coach, if you make it that far, I will teach you how to do your own publicity because mm-hmm. um, you can do a lot of it yourself. Oh, yeah. But you don't want to just rush into it and do the, you do it the wrong way, you know, <laughs> the copy paste messages to everyone. And... <laughs> it's terrible, actually. <laughs> yeah. I got one last night, a DM that is a copy paste. She even got my name wrong. Oh, hey, no. Paula. Copy paste. <laughs> like, I'm not Paula. Yeah. But if you see, the only conversation we've had is another time that you <laughs> sent me the copy and paste thing. You don't want to do that. Like, no. engage with people without expecting anything in return. And if you're commenting on that industry or media person stuff all the time and you're you know, commenting on their dog, you love their dog, whatever it is, so that it's not just about the industry and what you do and develop a relationship. When you do have an ask, they might be more apt to do it. Okay, you need me to go vote something for you? Well, sure. I'll do that for you. But if that's the only time I hear you from you, then (laughs) no. 
I have a lot to add by way of comment. So let's see if I can remember <laughs> everything. <laughs> but number one is I, I publish a ton of content every week. And trust me, there are days when I say, what is the point? This is not going to sell any more books. It's not going to get me any course sales or program sales. Why would I do it? And then recently, I wrote a post about becoming an award-winning composer for Banzoo. Well, that post got picked up then by Hypebot. <laughs> A magazine that's interested in this piece. And that's why you do it. Those types of opportunities are rare. They don't come around every day. But that's one of the reasons why you just keep going because you don't know who's reading, who's watching, who's looking. Yeah, you never know what what's gonna hit. And but if you only post once in a blue moon, exactly. It could be the greatest post in the world, but nobody's gonna see it. <laughs> exactly. But if you're posting consistently, consistently and it's quality every time. You never know. One thing can kind of put you in front of a lot of people. The second thing was I have started building my story repository because something finally hit home for me about this that people by now have probably heard most of what I have to share about how to. They know my method. They know my approach. They'd rather hear about uh, you know the kittens that I was living with for half weeks or the vacation I've been on or the the miserable life events that have unfolded in the last month yeah. than, than to hear about another how-to article. Uh, and the power of a story, uh, rather than let's send an email campaign today, it's more like, what can I share a week I've just had or care about a recent experience or even a past experience that fundamentally changed me? And and those yeah. are far more powerful than just about any launch or sales message I've ever crafted, really. I, I've kind of slacked on the uh, how-to content because my brain doesn't think in three easy steps to do this. <laughs> I want to sit you down and tell you everything I know. <laughs> Definitely. And because that's more valuable, but like, yeah, for I need to get better at the doing some how-to content out there instead of just always telling stories, but you know, it's a good to have a balance. And yes, if you are doing how to maybe start with a story of why this how to is important. Precisely. You have the opportunity to meld the two in a really powerful way. Yeah. Yeah. Number three was present day marketing, which it seems to be moving more and more towards video having YouTube as your home base on the web, driving traffic to your website or email list or music or whatever yeah. it may be. And those two things are like critical at this juncture, um, more so than any other social media platform. Like I've pretty much reduced my focus to Twitter and YouTube now because Twitter works to an extent and YouTube, I love podcasting and, and I've decided, you know, like Charles Barkley, there's points when I to quit and throw an owl on my podcast it forever. Who cares anymore? And uh, I keep coming back to it. So I said, I've decided I'm going to keep podcasting with the full notes. Might not get more than 300 downloads per episode ever. Right. But Me, those people that do listen will be more engaged. Way more engaged than, say, yeah. a YouTube viewer or a, a reader of a blog post. But yeah, every other platform, that. it's short attention span. That's right. But exactly. I'd e even, um, I'm starting to do podcast booking for other coaches and things like that. And, mm. you know, it, the statistics are like most people that start a podcast episode, they finish it. So that's 20 to 60 minutes of dedicated time that people are listening to you. So even if 25 people are listening to you, that's 25 people that hear your whole message. That's precisely it. And these people are far more engaged and far more likely just on, hey, I kind of know these now and I want to go buy their stuff. Mm -hmm. Far more likely than a reader or a viewer. And I've recognized that, you know, once I got a video on YouTube that that now has over 10,000 views. It's not the biggest video on the channel, but the but the biggest recent one that I've had, I, I realized right away mm -hmm. that the opportunity was was starting to move in that direction. So yeah, I think it's it's yeah. for me moving forward, it really is to kind of balance out the two. Yeah. And like I'm starting to think of other platforms too that I'm not utilizing. There are Just so many now. 
just because like Instagram, like mm-hmm. I don't want it to be my full-time job. And people are starting to think about, well, if it's impossible on Instagram, what's less crowded? <laughs> and um, and I heard something the other day that it's like, well, not many people are utilizing YouTube stories or like shorts. That's right. Yep. So even every reel or TikTok you've ever posted, just go repost it on YouTube shorts because it's fairly new. Yes. That's a little bit easier to get on that. And so, yeah, I haven't done too much on YouTube. So I'm thinking getting on YouTube more and then Pinterest and, and even LinkedIn. I've been poking around there. It's a little advanced, but if you can get a virtual assistant to to handle it, the whole idea of video distribution has worked very well for my coach and, and others. I, I've tried it out myself, but having one video go yeah. up on TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and then you could even add LinkedIn in there will instantly double, triple, quadruple, sometimes 10x your views. And if it's the right people... Yeah. That'll create way more opportunity for sure. Repurpose content so you don't have yes. to create something completely different, but create it for the platform. That's it. Yeah. Don't share it all at the same time at the same type. You have to tailor it to the platform you're posting, but definitely you never know who's going to see it on a different platform that maybe you're not paying that much attention to. Yeah. Yeah. I'm well past the point of having to reinvent now. So I guess I could consider myself lucky that way. (laughs) But when when you're still in the process of developing, it can take a while for sure. And then, you know, the first playbook is getting coverage, which you kind of got into in a way. I like that it matches up with pretty much what I cover in in my latest book, The Renegade Musician, or forthcoming book, I should say. And what else would you add about preparing for interviews and being ready for PR. Well, I think that's kind of the whole point I got into coaching is because I lived in that phase three. Right. Yeah. And in order to be successful of getting my clients press coverage, they need those first two but I didn't necessarily get involved in those first two. Mm. And if you're just kind of I just, I actually got tired of doing publicity because I want to be successful too, <laughs> you know? No kidding. As, and also, I want you to be successful. Uh-huh. Like, if I'm loving the artist and the music, it's like, I want you to be successful. And that's, I guess, why I've also doing coaching is because I can show you the step by step. But just going from zero to hiring a publicist. And also, I watch so many artists waste their money. Yes. It's expensive. So you're spending thousands of dollars on a publicist, a radio promoter, maybe even a social media manager so that you don't have to do all that. But then three, six months later, you're like, that's all I got for the results. I got some blog posts. Yep. They're not that (laughs) visited. And uh, maybe I got on a couple radio stations, a couple spins. Maybe I got you know, some followers on social media, but they're not necessarily my ideal fans. So what did I spend all that money for? And it's it's too many artists. They want that quick fix. And they think, okay, I hire these people, these experts, they'll get all that for me, but they can only work with what you give them. That's right. And it's hard to pitch, especially now to say, here's a yet another Singer songwriter with a new song and video. Mm, the bio doesn't say much other than where you're from and <laughs> you um, play guitar at age eight. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> who cares? It's just the same story. And so, media, because you also have to think about it on the media side, it's like they get tons of these. Yeah. Tell them a story. And so, In my coaching, when we get to the media, it's by then you've already figured out your stories. You've already been putting yourself out there on social media. You've been doing videos. You've been telling your stories. By the time you get to the media, you could just go into hiring a publicist at that point. 
but you could also do start to do some of it yourself. And then when you can't really get any further on your own, that's when you hire a publicist. That's when you hire a radio promoter. That's when you can hire a VA to help you with the social media or social media manager to help you make it easier for you. That's when the team comes in. And then also that's when the other industry comes in. It's like same with publicity, but an agent is not going to take you on until you're already booking your tours and making yeah. money. And if you're not, then they're not interested because what when it comes to like managers and labels and agents, they don't make money unless you make money. Whereas the marketing teams, you have to pay them. These other industries are even harder to get because they don't make money unless you do. So unless you're touring the world and uh, booking your own shows and making money, it's hard to get an agent. So my plan with this whole method Fans, media, and industry attraction method, taking you through personal branding, taking you through purpose-driven content, and doing some of your own publicity. At that point, media and industry and fans are all coming to you. And instead, it's, you're not always pitching yourself. That's the ideal position to be in. It just takes time to get there, and you need to be patient, too. This, I don't offer quick fixes. <laughs> so even other... <laughs> I've seen other uh, courses out there that are like, you know, four sessions and we'll have you, you know, your whole marketing plan done. I'm like, no, <laughs> mm -mm. more than that, quit wasting your money on the quick fi fixes. Exactly. Invest the time, energy, and yes, you'll have to invest money, but just be a bit more smart about it. And you might even invest more money in a more program that you're actually going to implement and take the time to do the work it might take a year it might take five it, it might mm -hmm. you never know right it's a work in progress you're always going to be revisiting your brand to make sure it's still who you are because we as we evolve and change your brand should evolve and change too maybe your wants your vision changes keep revisiting it but uh it's worth it if you get to live the dream that you always wanted to live yeah. and make the impact that you want to make. It's definitely not the type of industry where naivete serves you well. <laughs> if you if you still think that artist exploitation doesn't exist, you don't have far to look. There's plenty of shills and charlatans who kind of oh, yes. do a quick hit and run in the music industry and try to take all your money. Maybe they offer a real service. But mm -hmm. that real service is probably going to be the same as spending thousands of dollars in PR. Here you go. A couple of blog placements and one playlist. Yeah. <laughs> like, Gee, thanks. I just spent $5,000 on that. <laughs> exactly. Because <laughs> that's what's going to cost you. Like, you know, mm -hmm. that was also another thing with publicity. It's like you don't have the budget for PR and marketing, but because you just spent all your money on recording and hiring some famous producer. <laughs> nobody's going to hear the recording unless you have a marketing budget <laughs> no i mean i had a friend who he sees somewhat new to music but he spent forty thousand dollars on an album on his first album and i kind of said why <laughs> and he's like no one seems to care that i'm 40 50k in debt and then i paid it off and i said dude that's amazing but it's not inspiring you know what I mean? Like we all have debt. So debt in itself is not inspiring. The inspiring part is what did you do to raise yourself up and get out there and share your music? And, yeah. I mean, I wish I'm nothing but the best, right? But I'm like, that's usually not how a career begins. I understand how and why, but I think you could get 80% of the results for 10% of the budget. Yeah. Yeah. And like, I do have noticed that too with um, some producers, even producers with big credits, they push because they have these big credits and you think, if I just had this guy produce it and this guy's interested in working with me, yes, I must be amazing. It's <laughs> like, no, they got to make a living too. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Not think... all their work is with the superstars. They need to actually, you know, make a living too and they'll promise you the world and if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is, is the motto basically with the music industry. And that's, again, why I got into coaching, because I saw too many artists waste their money 
on PR. And I was always the honest PR publicist. <laughs> so yeah. I didn't get a lot of work either because I kept talking people out of hiring me. <laughs> <laughs> I get that. I mean, but there's a lot of people that will take your money. Oh, yeah. And in a heartbeat. Make you all the promises so that you hire them. And then when you're like, why am I not getting the results? Then they'll kind of turn it on you because you didn't do this, this, and this. But maybe you should have done this, this, and this before you even thought about hiring someone. And it just takes time to kind of, you know, learn. Everyone has to do a lot of the things you do have to kind of make your own mistakes. Yes. That's what you learn from. But hopefully coaches and mentors can help you, you know, avoid some big expensive mistakes. <laughs> well, that's the key, right? Uh, please do invest in coaching yeah. and mentorship if you're serious about a music career. That's another thing that's yeah. pretty stunning to me that, oh, you know, we can just navigate this minefield all by ourselves. Boom. Whoops. Didn't mean for that to happen. And now mm -hmm. our tour band busted and we can't play any more gigs and we have no income source. And oh, my God, which could have been navigated much earlier in the process with the right coaching. Yeah. I don't know if you found this, but I find that there's not a lot of good coaches in the music industry. It, it feels like not a lot of good ones. That's musicians a good... don't think about coaching in the way, whereas I work with actors, too, and it's like they're used to having an acting coach. So it's not a big stretch to have a yeah. business acting coach or having a marketing coach and having a, you know, whatever coach. It's like once you kind of see the value of coaching. Uh, once I saw the value of coaching, I got a coach for everything, but because totally. <laughs> it just, it gets you where you want to go faster. And there's also the difference between consulting and coaching. There's a lot of consultants in the music industry that will tell you all the things you need to do, but maybe those steps are not right for you. And that's the thing with coaching is we help you Absolutely. figure out what's best for you. So it's yes. kind of a coach consultant slash thing because we do have the experience and the knowledge to share, but we also will help you figure out what path is right for you. Yeah, full stop. So this is not the end, to, end of the interview yet, but I just want to make sure um, listeners can get your playbook for free on your website, right? Yes. And Wonderful. I think I'm going to turn it into a course. I think that's you know, a great idea. Yes. We're all about video these days. <laughs> so, um, yeah, like to take, it'll still be free. Like right now you can get the free fans, media and industry attraction playbook, but I think soon I'm going to turn it into a, a mini course to, so I can walk you through it and maybe add on to some of the topics and, and, uh, yeah. And, and if it you also want to turn it into an ebook and a paperback and a hardcover and audible i can help <laughs> that's yeah. what i do so i think I, I do want all that it's just i think i will probably want help with the actual writing of it makes sense I somehow block with that right it's like mm -hmm. i could talk about everything i know for hours and hours and hours but put me in front of a word doc and i'm like i got nothing to say that's yeah. actually all I would need is a tra transcript of you talking about all of yes. the hours. <laughs> and then you figure out how to put that into nice format. paragraphs. A hundred percent. That's what I do. Yes. <laughs> yes. We need you. Yeah. <laughs> and I guess this kind of connects to everything we've been talking about already. And in a way you've kind of answered it, but you know, just based on everything you've studied and looked at and everyone you've talked to, why do artists resist marketing? What's the reason? They do. Res they're, they're getting better, uh -huh. but they, yeah, they resist it. And I think it's because it's kind of their, I don't know how this, how young people have this, but they still do is that it's old way of thinking of old music industry right. where back in the day you could just be an artist and you did wait and be discovered. And then some label and managers, agents, they do all that work for you and you can just create but somehow they haven't figured out that that doesn't exist anymore. And I get it if you grew up in that, but it's the young people. I don't really get why they, what do you mean you're waiting for a label deal? Yes. Or, <laughs> what label and what do you think they're going to do for you? Exactly. And so I think it's just lack of education. 
also back in the past of the music industry, marketing and branding wasn't as authentic as mm. you need it to be now. Mm. Whereas how many stories have you heard of the teen pop stars where the, the label managers, they put the image on them and it wasn't even them. Like, that's why Christina Aguilera's first album and second album are completely different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like first album, they put the brand on her as the girl next door, the cute little blonde. And then the next album, she got to do what she wanted and you get dirty. But it was uh, more authentic to her. It's more who she is. And I certainly and wouldn't so, say it was a surprise because it it kind of, I mean, it, everyone followed in those same footsteps. Britney Spears, Jessica Simpson, they all yeah. went from good to bad. And it was so yeah. predictable. But people like love to talk about that. That was big publicity in those days. Yeah, yeah. Even Alanis, like, you know, her first mm -hmm. albums were all pop dance. You know, there are so many examples of the major labels putting a brand on you. And then I think when you start talking to artists about marketing and branding, somehow that trigger goes off and they think, no, like, I don't want to be like, I don't want a brand put on me. I don't want to be inauthentic. So I think a part of that fear comes in. But again, education. And that's why I lead with authenticity and your purpose. And, you know, I don't actually use a lot of marketing speak mm, as I'm yes. an artist too. I, <laughs> I, I translate all that marketing speak into fun, creative, artsy words and that have more meaning. Like I always feel like I need to explain personal branding a bit more because I don't want people to have the misinterpretation of it's just your, you know, the outward stuff. It starts with inner. It starts with what do you really want? Why do you want it? What's your purpose? What impact do you want to make? And that's what gets you fired up to continue and do this. But without that, then that leaves you with that inauthentic or, you know, we all have the stories, but we just don't tell them. So that's how everyone gets that boring bio of so-and-so grew up in such and such and started playing guitar and did this and did that and did this and did that. Yeah, I've seen much you know, <laughs> like artists who pretty much list off credentials. I won this award mm -hmm. and I appeared on this radio station and then I won this award and then I appeared on this station and then I performed here and I was like, yeah, holy cow, it's a wonder you've been invited to play at so many places. Why? <laughs> you don't have a story. You don't yeah. have a story. And I want, to, I coach my clients so that they lead with their purpose. That first line of your bio or your first introduction, it should be a couple sentences that makes people go, oh, tell me more. Precisely. What is it like if you lead with your purpose of like, well, when I was a kid, whatever your your deep, meaningful story of what really inspired you to get into music, that's most powerful coaching session I do with artists is the why. What is your why? Why do you do what you do? Because everyone has, you know, the first answer to that is going to be like, I love it. And then you ask more and you get a little bit, but I dig in and we get to the bottom of it. And it's usually a crying session. You know, it gets to the purpose of what is it really about? And that's what drives you. And if you could lead with that, that's what connects with people. Yeah. And we'll go tell me more. It's it's not the most compelling headline either ever, but I could say something like my dad was in a motorcycle crash when I was 13 and I needed some kind of creative outlet to escape from it and to heal from it. That would be, you know, my opener would be something like that. Yeah, that's way more interesting, yeah, you know, way more because it also shows that there's depth to it. There's if I continue talking to you. I'm going to get some good stories. I'm going to get, I'm going to be interested, you know, by leading with that story. It's, it shows your vulnerability right off the bat. It shows that you have, you're not just doing music for fun or fame or money, whatever it is. It's superficial. It's that, that deeper meaning of why it's so important to you. And then that fires other people up. 
to want to share more of themselves too. And that's where connection happens. I have a selfish question, although I think ultimately it's going to end up helping other people that are listening. And that would be, you know, you've been a panelist and a mentor at a few different, let's say, notable conferences, which as we know, have really just been online in the last couple of years. But how would how would someone like me go about landing more of those opportunities? I've certainly had a few great speaking gigs, but not as much as I would like. For most of mine, I they just kind of happened. Um that's great. But now I guess I'm being more purposeful about it. Um I think I do want to have I've been more of a mentor at Canadian Music Week, yep. but one day I want to kind of run my own panel or have a workshop at it. And my plan for that is just to get more, um, to really come to them with an idea and a presentation. I'm not ready to do that yet, but that's, if you had a, an idea for a panel or a workshop for a conference like that go for it pitch it um but also like it's who you know it's <laughs> who is it that's picking the speakers at whatever conference um where are you based in vancouver area okay you're canadian too yes i am yes i'm from vancouver as well but oh, i'm cool. toronto based conferences are different there i went to breakout west once there Mm -hmm. And I'm so used to Toronto where everyone's talking to each other and it's a big networking schmooze fest. And then I went to a conference in Vancouver and everyone's just standing there waiting to get in. No one's talking to anyone. You must have run into all the Albertans because the Albertans are usually weird like that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, don't you want to use this opportunity to, I don't know, industry people in the room, maybe talk to them and I don't know, get free advice. I don't know. I'm not um, going to Yes, yeah, so it's different. <laughs> <laughs> I had a great time um, at DIY Musician Conference in Austin in 2019. Oh, yeah. But besides my friends and the contacts that I already had, I was surprised to find exactly the same thing. No one's posting to social media. No one's connecting with each other. I was like, why are yeah. you here again? <laughs> Just to see Questlove? You should, go, you should go shake his hand and ask him some things, you know? Yeah, yeah. Canadian Music Week this past year was actually really cool because it was the first time live in a while, but it was smaller. Mm. It wasn't as big as it usually is, which also meant I got to meet and talk to Chuck D, which very cool. In the bigger context of Canadian Music Week a few years ago, that wouldn't have happened. It would have been he'd be whisked off to the private area right but it was a little bit more you know um smaller so you got to make more connections there wasn't as many people but it was good for the people that were there to make good deeper connections um but back to your question i would just research who is the who is in charge of choosing speakers and workshops at whatever yeah. conference or festival that you want to be a part of have you been involved with indie week i i have talked to daryl her so i've had him on the yeah. podcast yeah yeah so like if you had an idea he even i don't know if they still do it they were doing those weekly things as That's well right. like come up with a topic and you know or we could do it together we could just say hey we want to do a session on marketing and branding and we're here for you, you know, and I totally do that. I'm sure it'll be an easy yes. And um, that's a start anyways. Absolutely. Um, and the more you do that, like, is there, a, is there still a conference or whatever in Vancouver, you know, Breakout West and is there anything uh, else happening? Obviously there hasn't been a whole lot in the last two years and I yeah. still need to get a little more acquainted with, with a local flavor. But yeah. uh, we're, we're gradually getting getting back to it. I think travel is starting to open up finally in a meaningful way. So, well, it's also like the same advice that I was giving artists back an hour ago. Whenever we started, um, yeah. you know, is the same to you. Research the key people, decision makers, and start building a relationship with them long before you ever ask. Yeah, and 
find them, like make a sheet of uh, accounts on Instagram that you're going to visit every week. Make a point of connecting with them and talking to them and and just asking about what they do and be a resource for them. Yes. Like, hey, I thought you'd appreciate this article. I thought you'd find it interesting. Here you go. Be a resource for them. And then down the line, it's a lot easier to say, hey, I have an idea for a panel. Or maybe you don't want to start with that. Maybe you want to be the moderator of a panel that already have in the works and you could be the moderator. They're always looking for people like that too, to be the host and be the moderator between the panelists. Yeah, I think you're spot on. I, I recently found a musician coach who was doing, I think, weekly lessons on discord so i thought mm -hmm. to myself well really i could take a load off your shoulders and and offer something <laughs> one of those yeah. weeks you know yeah yeah discord's another one i gotta look into <laughs> that's what i was thinking it's like i'm gonna build my own but if i can be a part of other people's discords that'd be pretty cool yeah and then even if you do have your own like you have your podcast like you can also um repurpose yeah, and also offer them something like if you're, you know, you want to be on their platform, invite them on your platform if it's yeah. a fit. And they already you know, have been, it. incidentally. So, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's my plan of doing these things. Um, yeah, it's just being more intentional with it. And I'm creative, multi-passionate. And the thing with multi-passionates is we have a million ideas and sometimes we get a little scattered and, you know, so the, we always got to <clears throat> draw it back into, okay, what is my focus? What is my priority? Other things you can write down for future. Yeah, it's so true. I mean, I, I pretty much refer to myself in the, in the same manner. I don't always talk about it, but <clears throat> besides music, I mean, I write very competently. I speak very well. I've been called one of the best interviewers by some of my friends, maybe not notable, but nevertheless, I'm a great speaker and presenter. I can make videos. I can make audios. There's just so many things. Uh, I'm in the process of establishing multiple niche websites again, something yeah. I did years ago. So web design, graphic design. Yeah, definitely multi-passionate. Yeah. And that's part of why I really focus on multi-passionates because <clears throat> the world always tells us that you can't do all that. You do have to focus and you do have to narrow it down and all that advice. And I've just got to the point that I'm rejecting that. <laughs> yeah. And even when I start coaching, they still tell you niche down, niche down, niche down. And I, and I did. But then my favorite clients were the clients that were multi-passionate. It's like I narrowed down to I help musicians and actors, but the musicians and actors that I loved working with the most and the ones that were attracted to me were multi-passionate. They're a musician, but they're also a animator filmmaker or yeah. singer songwriter, yoga instructor, sound healer, or they're an actor and they're also a graphic designer. And, you know, these are my favorite people and they would kind of, reluctantly tell me that they do these other things <laughs> because they expected me to say, you got to narrow down, you got to niche down. And I was like, that's exciting. Let's do it. <laughs> and they're like, what? <laughs> yes, you can do all that. Maybe not all at once. There's ways of focusing. So yeah, like I have a million ideas, but I have to go, okay, this is my priority in the next few months. I'm working on creating a course for the fans media and industry attraction method, um, both the free option, which there'll be a free course about the method kind of based on the playbook, but that playbook is pretty much what I coach artists through, and it's been mostly one-on-one -on -one coaching for the last few years, so I want to help more people and also make it more affordable for people. So, you know, work it into like a group program course. So that's kind of my priority right now. But yeah, one day that Canadian Music Week workshop and book that you're going to help me write. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> all Absolutely. that. 
Yeah. Gotta have big dreams and, and the passion and drive and focus to get there. That's right. It'll happen. The meme, the meme of it all for me is I tried to focus and focus made me miserable. (laughs) (laughs) I pretty much do things in 90 day increments now. It's like, this is the campaign. Okay. I can focus on a campaign for 90 days. If it means I can prepare two books and a newsletter and a members only audios. (laughs) Sure. This is the section of the podcast that is lovingly called not the Tim Ferriss section (laughs) where I delve a little bit deeper into the personality of the guest and you can provide answers that are short or long. It doesn't matter. What's the last uh, YouTube video you watched? It was probably something today. (laughs) (laughs) It's hard to remember, isn't it? What was I watching? It was a how-to for something. Uh, (laughs) I'm always figuring out my own tech. So what am I working on? I'm having, I'm working on that course platform. And I probably watched a video of how to, what is it? What was the last one? Something to do with how to set up your course or insert your content. Something like that. Yeah, I was also probably recording Oh, you know what it was? Is that I discovered I could do it on Canva. Oh, yeah. That's so right. that I made the slides in Canva and I was Googling. So how do I screen share and <laughs> do I do Zoom or do I do I have live webinar? I have a video thing. And and then it was like, oh, you could just do it in Can- Canva. And then there was a video on how to do that. And I'm like, well, that's easy. <laughs> That's right. I just had a friend who made slides for her course in in Canva. And you can make it so that your face is in a little circle at the bottom. <laughs> yeah. You can do that with Loom as well. Loom is also a pretty great piece of software. Right. Loom came up as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what is your daily routine like? I'm not a morning person. <laughs> so, but yet the first thing I do when I wake up is grab my phone. I have that bad habit. <laughs> so I yeah, that. in bed, I'm surrounded by cats. I'm looking <laughs> on my phone of all the new email updates and social media updates. And then sometimes I look at the news and then I put the phone back down and try and sleep some more. Then <laughs> when I eventually force myself to get up, I I work for a while before I get to the Oh, I got, I should go eat. So yeah, then I'm in my little closet office, work a little bit, then oh, I got to go eat. Then I make some tea, have a little break, eat, come back, work on my computer. Basically, I'm working on my computer a lot. <laughs> okay. It sounds and exactly like my days. <laughs> forgetting to eat and going, oh, what time is it? <laughs> That's my daily routine. Pretty much exactly my days. Yep. Yeah. Uh, what's the greatest challenge you've overcome? That I've overcome. Oh, man, so many. Mm. I think it's just because I was insanely shy. And it's part of my why of why I do what I do and why I love arts and entertainment so much is because when I was a kid, I was too shy to be a performer myself. Um But I just loved it. So I always just wanted to be around performers. And every career I've had, I was a photographer, I was a makeup artist, I was publicist, coach, all these different things. And it was all the purpose to be around performers. And I think over the years, I've overcome my shyness and I'm uh, getting comfortable. Now my challenge is being on video more. But yeah, I can... I can be a public speaker now. I've taught courses and I don't think about it anymore. I think I'm just more confident in what I, who I am and what I offer and what my knowledge is. And I'm just eager to share it all and with everyone so I could help others mm. and yeah, help others overcome everything that's holding them back. I feel like I was a late bloomer. Mm. You know, I held myself back for so long and I still do and it's pushing forward and now I'm like that's why I love doing what I do because even my childhood impression of performers that they're all extroverted and confident and well we know that's not true (laughs) there's Mm -hmm. many introvert musicians and artists and performers that 
they want to hide behind their art. And they think because yeah. I'm the first one to say, I don't want to be doing this or I'm not, I wasn't comfortable doing this. It takes practice. And now I can help other artists come out of their shell, express themselves, tell their stories. And in a way that when we get to the why part and it's telling your vulnerability and sometimes it's traumatic. People have had traumatic lives or experiences and you're like, in what world would I ever lead with this story? Right. (laughs) But I've seen it happen so many times where once you verbalize it, it's so freeing that you think, oh, I've never, like they tell me I'm the first person they tell. And then all of a sudden they're telling everybody. They're like, I'm in. It's so freeing. And so I love being able to help people and artists to overcome all that stuff that holds us back and having the tools to express yourself and put yourself out there. And the more you do it, the more comfortable you are. And I think because where I came from, so quiet, reserved, not sharing who I am, and now I'm doing it, I think you could do it too. (laughs) What you said about putting yourself out there, uh, the reason I got into network marketing for about four or five years is to gain some more people and communication skills and to come out of my shell. And yeah. I got I got from talking to one person today and saying hi, having meaningful conversations with five people a day eventually. And it got hilarious at points, really. Um I got the call the the cops called on me once because someone thought I was creepy. And uh <laughs> I am a teddy bear. I don't uh, do anything to anyone without full consent ever. But yeah. <laughs> But they they just interpreted the situation differently. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's hilarious. Uh, it was it was it was worth doing, um, despite whatever things showed up on my path that were weird. Yeah, yeah, and I, part of it's just showing up because even when I started going to conferences where I didn't know anybody, and other people would show up like four o'clock in the afternoon and after partying it all night and I'd be like, I was at, especially in the early days, I was at that hotel at 11 o'clock. Didn't know anybody, but I showed my face. (laughs) I show, I showed up and you, you show up often enough. People start talking to you. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Show up, be happy, be smiley, be open to talk to people. Even if you're not comfortable starting the conversation or talking to people yet, you will. You'll get there, but even just show up, meet one person, then that person's going to come to, you know, I tell people if they're coming to, I try to get artists to come to Canadian Music Week. Cause I'm like, why are you not there? Even if you're an artist playing, why are you not at the hotel during the day? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, oh, I don't really know what's going on there. Or I don't really know anyone. I'm like, you know, me. Um, you come say hi to me. I introduce you to everyone I know. You go to panels. You talk to the people beside you. And before you know it, you've got lots of people that you're hanging with. And you never know what can happen from that. Yes. Show up is the big part. It's a big reason why I insist on publishing daily. There would be no other reason except to maybe document the journey. But you get a lot of the low-hanging fruit opportunities that other people <clears> miss <throat> by virtue of just being there. Yeah. 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 Even a lot of the people that I've met or or got to work with. Like, how do you know so and so? Or how did you meet so and so? I'm like, I was there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Absolutely. Especially if you're in a band and you're playing bars and you need to be out, like same music industry. I was out four or five nights a week. Mm-hmm. You know, with Daryl Hers from Indie Week, and yep. we paid our dues where we're out every single night. And when the rock star comes to town and they're at the bovine, yeah, we're there because we're already there. Like, yeah, you know, but if you, you know, go out once a month, maybe the night before you're playing to convince people to go see you, <laughs> not going to work. <laughs> you yeah. got to be out there seeing other bands. And supporting each other so that they'll come to your show too and meeting fans, 
meeting the people that are out going to shows. It's cute. Now I never leave my house, but I've paid my dues. <laughs> <laughs> Amen to that. Uh, what's the greatest victory you've celebrated? Greatest victory. Surviving. <laughs> Surviving. I think I've been in my own business for 18 years now. Surviving and still staying with it. Hmm. Like it, it's a roller coaster. And yeah, it's like one day not knowing how you're going to pay your rent. And then, you know, then all of a sudden it's busy and you're doing everything you love and you get these dream opportunities and then nothing. And it's that roller coaster. And also because I change my focus from time to time. And sometimes you're starting over again. And, yep. you know, just being able to, I think, to overcome all the playing it safe and being able to be comfortable with risk. I think that's the biggest thing to overcome is just to still be chasing my dreams and still be being a resource for artists, which is the whole reason I got into this is to help artists. So to still just even have more to offer now. Yep. And yes, my cat has joined us. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's confounding and confusing at times, but a hundred percent my experience as well. You, I'll yeah. see you know book sales stagnate for a period, and I just go, I don't, I don't even understand. It was that was selling pretty steadily for quite a while, and then suddenly it pops up to ten or twenty sales in a day, and you're like, what just happened? <laughs> and that it's just a you repeat. can't control anything, you can't predict anything, and that's it. It's also anything. focusing on what you can control. Yes. Speaking of books, are there any books that have helped you on your journey? The Artist's Way. Hmm. There was a book. I feel like the the two books that I read that inspired me to move to Toronto in the first place, it was The Artist's Way. And then also there was this book called something like Get Off Your Butt and Do It. <laughs> Get Off Your Butt and Do It. And, and what else lately? You mentioned Questlove earlier. Yes. I think his audiobook is the best audiobook ever existed. Wow. <laughs> so, no kidding. Quest Love, Creative Quest. I got the hard copy, cop, cover copy of the book, I think because I saw him speak somewhere mm -hmm. and it was autographed and whatever, but invest in the audiobook because he's a musician and he's a producer and a DJ. He yeah. DJs the whole damn thing. Wow. And so he's telling it's a creativity book, but he's telling the behind the scenes stories of creativity of Prince, of Michael Jackson, of David Bowie. It's like all these people that he's experienced and worked with and witnessed their creative process. So he's telling stories about these people's creative process all the while DJing it. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> is the greatest audiobook ever. Um, for being multi-passionate, there's Barbara Shears Refuse to Choose. There's um another book called The Renaissance Soul. Hmm. Those are two books that I feel are the Bibles of multi-passionates and multi-potentialites. It's how to, you know, I draw some of my coaching from those books of how to manage when you have so many passions and how to figure out what to focus on and things like that. I have a lot of creativity books and get off your butt books and branding books. And mm. <laughs> for personal branding, the one that's pretty amazing right now is uh, called Simply Be is the, I don't know if that's her book called, but it's Simply Be is the, uh, I think it's the title of the book and that's her mar marketing agency. It gives an, a kind of an authentic view on personal branding and some of the things that I, I talk about too had a similar view on personal branding. Yeah, those personal libraries are so key. Well, we've gone well over an hour. So <laughs> thanks for your time and generosity, Diane. Is there anything else I should have asked? No. And I'm just looking at the time going, oh, wait, I have another interview at four. Um, what <laughs> is anything else you have to ask? Um, uh, I have a podcast called Multi-Passionate Artists. Yep. And it was kind of interview based. But again, 
talking about, you know, overcoming uh, your comfort zones. There's a reason I started with podcasts, so I didn't have to be on camera at the time. <laughs> and uh, and also putting the focus on other people was good. But now I'm pushing myself to do more solo shows. And also I want to do coaching episodes. So if anyone's interested in getting a free coaching session and having it air on the podcast, connect with me. That's uh, so funny because I had a very similar idea too. Yeah. Well, I offered it in one of my recent bundles and I said, you'll get a YouTube feature if you want it. Um, we'll show a, a band yeah. transformation or artist transformation. Oh yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you get, uh, get an experience coaching through something that you're struggling with or whether it's about personal branding or PR, or if you just have questions, we could do a Q and A session, and uh, but it'll be on the podcast so that other people can benefit from it too. So, my website is dianefoy.com, and I think the volunteer one is just dianefoy.com slash volunteer to volunteer for the podcast to be coached, and yes, and also dianefoy.com slash freebie for the free resource of the fans, media, and industry attraction playbook that will soon be a mini course. Great. Well, everyone, make sure to take advantage of what Diane's offering here. It sounds amazing. The playbook, it's well worth it. So thanks again for being part of the show. Thank you so much. This is fun. You know, over the years, people have said to me, DA, I really resonate with your writing. I think you should start a magazine. Well, we've been planning this for a while. It's not a magazine, but it is a print newsletter, our brand new print newsletter, Elite Players Newsletter. If you haven't had the opportunity to check it out yet, you want to go to musicentrepreneurhq.com slash elite newsletter. That's E-L-I-T-E newsletter. You get four incredible bonuses just for signing up to receive the first two issues, including four group Q&A and coaching sessions, members only audios, a lifetime subscription, no less. My latest book, The Music Entrepreneur Companion Guide, you're going to get a physical hardcover copy. And my forthcoming book, The Renegade Musician, also a physical hardcover copy. So go to musicentrepreneurhq.com slash elite newsletter to learn more about this incredible offer. Thanks for listening. The opening theme, closing theme, and closing segment ambient music was created by Brian Bob Young. If other music was used in this episode, it's credited in the show notes at musicentrepreneurhq.com. Please leave us a rating and review in iTunes to help us spread the word about the show. 